Well, one person who has seen the evolution of this technology is Walter Greenleaf. He's chief scientist at Pear Therapeutics, which you saw there in that report. Now, he's also a visiting scholar at Stanford's Virtual Human Interaction Lab. Mark spoke with Greenleaf to find out what clinical VR was like when he helped pioneer the field decades ago. VR at the time was very expensive. Uh, we used uh, uh, co computers that cost half a million dollars, and uh, we cobbled together some head-mounted displays. Um, uh, it was, but it was worked. It worked. For example, we had a virtual Vietnam that some of my colleagues developed that was used to help with post-traumatic stress from Vietnam combat, and it worked very effectively. Even though the graphics were very uh, poor at the time, and uh, the headsets were so heavy sometimes that we had to counterbalance them with a brick to keep your head from falling forward. Uh, we were able to make some uh, great progress and help people who'd been sort of stuck for a while with, um, with the memories of their trauma. How does it differ now with um, the virtual reality today, which is so realistic? It's great to have very realistic environments because the people who are using it feel like it's more effective for them. But the clinicians, when they treat post-traumatic stress, are very good at doing it gradually. So, for example, if I was working with someone who had a fear of flying, the first time we might just have them look over in the virtual environment and see some airline tickets on, a, on their kitchen table and start thinking about going to the airport. And then the next time, maybe they get in a taxi cab and go to the airport. The time after that, maybe they're walking around the entranceway for an airport. So even though the environment's more realistic, the exposure sequence is done in a very um, careful manner. Is there always a danger of sort of re-traumatizing somebody? Sure, and that's why there's a, uh, a protocol established uh, so that you don't uh, re-traumatize the patient. And actually, that's the advantage of a virtual reality environment. If I was working with someone who had a fear of heights, um, I could take them gradually up in an elevator. And if I'm working with someone who has a fear of spiders, I could give them different models of spiders. But the virtual environments allow us a whole complexity of degrees of uh, exposure, and we can do it in a much more refined way, and actually much better than if I ask you to remember the worst thing that's ever happened to you. Uh, either your brain's not going to go there, and uh, uh, it's going to be, uh, you're not going to be able to evoke that state that we need to teach you the skills to manage, or uh, it might go there all the way, and you might have a panic attack. But if I have a virtual environment, then we can make it more of a story and we can gradually take you there. What are some of the things that virtual reality is being used for now? VR has been shown to be effective at helping people with addictions. It's been helpful for people who have autism and are on the autism spectrum. We've used it to help people with anxiety disorders. We've used it to help people with depression. We've used it to help patients and their families get ready for a scheduled operation be prepared psychologically. We've used VR to help with stroke rehabilitation or traumatic brain injury rehabilitation. We've helped people prepare for stressful situations like a job interview. What stage would you classify VR at right now in, in, medical, in the medical field? I'd say hold on to your seat. Uh, things are going to take off really fast. Maybe not as fast in medicine as they will in other areas, but uh, all the major technology companies, and, and I could give you a long list of companies that have spent billions of dollars um, on technology here that we're going to be able to leverage for other things. As it moves to medicine, it will take a little bit longer because in medicine we like to validate to know what works and what doesn't work and we want to make sure they're safe. But once it gets to medicine, it's going to take off pretty fast because it allows us to transcend the standard um, um, hospital, um, the patient comes to you um, paradigm. It allows the clinicians to reach out and measure things in a more realistic manner and provide interventions in a uh, wherever the patient is. I think VR is sort of at the 300 baud modem stage, to give an analogy to the internet. We, we see what we can do with it, we know it works, but it, it's still not quite there yet. Are you concerned about the opposite side of it, that uh, you're treating addiction that VR could create some addiction, especially with such overstimulation, the experiences, uh, pornography, all these things. Uh, is that being looked into? You bring up a, a, a good point. Um, I, I think right now uh, the, nobody wants to spend that much time in virtual environments. The real world is just much more interesting and engaging. The real world will still pull us back. And some people, of course, will get stuck there. But I think by and large it's not going to be any more addictive than many other things that are out there. That being said, we haven't had the ability and time to do the research on understanding how spending a lot of time in a virtual environment might affect the developing brain. 
We don't yet know all the ramifications of that on the developing visual uh, system and its relationship to uh, the, the rest of the sensory system in the body. Um, I'm not worried about it. My own personal impression is that um, it will be a little bit like um, getting into a car, getting out of a car, getting on a boat, getting out of a boat. Uh, we'll do some adapting to these different environments. Our brain is very good at that. But I am concerned about its effect on youngsters and the developing brain.